Russell Brand, who are you to edit a political magazine? Well, I suppose like a person who's been politely asked by an attractive woman. I don't know what the typical criteria is. I don't know many people that edit political magazines. Boris, he used to do one, didn't he? So I'm a, kind of a person with crazy hair, quite a good sense of humour, don't know much about politics, I'm ideal. But is it true you don't even vote? Yeah, no, I don't vote. Well, how do you have any authority to talk about politics then? Well, I don't uh, get my authority from this pre-existing paradigm which is quite narrow and only serves a few people. I look elsewhere for alternatives that might be of service to humanity. Alternate means, alternate political systems. Uh, they being? Well, I've not invented it yet, Jeremy. I had to do a magazine last week. I've had a lot on my plate. But I say, but here's the thing that it shouldn't do. Shouldn't destroy the planet. Shouldn't create massive economic disparity. Shouldn't ignore the needs of the people. The burden of proof is on the people with the power, not people like doing a magazine. How the great achievements of civilization have not come from government bureaus. Einstein didn't construct his theory under order from a, from a, a bureaucrat. The social order as we know it is created out of ideas, either directly or as a systemic consequence. Somebody somewhere did something which generated a group interest. Which then led to the implementation of a specific social component, either in a physical form, philosophical form, or both. Once a given set of ideas are entrusted by a large enough group of people, it becomes an institution. And once that institution is made dominant in some way, while existing for a certain period of time, that institution can then be considered an establishment. Institutional establishments are simply social traditions given the illusion of permanence. All um, higher species, mammals particularly, are competitive. While there is always a debate about genetics, it is uh, at its base a genetic competitiveness to pass on the traits uh, that made the species excel in its environment uh, in our uh, development. It's very easy to understand in the context of values, meaning what you think is important and not important, that information influences or conditioning is coming from the world around you. Make no mistake, every intellectual concept which each one of us finds merit with is the result of a cultural information influence one way or another. The environment is a self-perpetuating programming process and just like designing a software program for your computer, each human being is advertently and inadvertently programmed into their worldview. And then all the elite does is knows how to manipulate and punch those buttons and condition those and hone those and bring up certain instincts that have manifested through societal developments. Essentially what you're seeing with this ruling elite that you refer to that of course, they will use technology against humanity, the microchip, surveillance. We're seeing this rampantly. Why? Because their social system is failing. But do you not think this individualistic culture is in itself destroying the principles at a spiritual, human level? However, they are totally out of line with nature. So what they're implying will never really work because it will just produce more instability. The people will eventually rise up above it because the system is emergent and we are always learning new things, and things that do not work as the emergence proceeds will be phased out. Of community, do you not think that economic inequality creates in a human being a sense of injustice, of unfairness? Because people, do you know what, Candice, 90% of people that are rich, do you know why they're rich? They was born rich. Okay, I can tell you something, I think that economic disparity creates that <laughs> feeling, but a, a fundamental understanding in economics can do help you, you know conquer that? that. that the most people they have to preserve the structure. At least that's my opinion, and we can go into more detail for that. People that are rich are born rich. It's not like there's a tiny minority of people that are like you that come from a poor background and manage to overcome it. And this is what's a, pro a problem I've noticed with a lot of great people, is they sort of believe that their greatness is something that can be replicated, and I don't think it, it can. can. I see, so I believe in the individual, you don't. That's I our believe fundamental differences. But the primary goal of the individual should be to serve the community. I, I, I do not believe that the primary goal of what an individual... What do you think the primary I, I goal think of the individual should be? that once an individual feels serve that they the have individual. served... So you're, you just, you're discounting the human spirit. I'm the not discounting... Yes. To continue the analogy, uh, the human brain is a piece of hardware, and the environment around you constitutes the programming team uh, which creates the values and perspective. I bought it 10 years ago for $60,000. I could sell it today for 600. The illusion has become real. Every word you know has been taught to you one way or another, and thus every concept and belief you have is a result of this same influence. And the more real it becomes, 
the more desperate they want it. Capitalism at its finest. Jacques Fresco once asked me, how much of you is you? The answer, of course, is kind of a paradox. For either nothing is me or everything is me. When it comes to the information I understand and act upon. Right. Um, he was counting yes, it. it. I'm is. saying that's all let there is. You, let me ask you a question. No, there's not. In, in, in a humanity, think of animals in the wild. You don't even have to go to humanity. We can just think about animals in the wild. What is our human instinct, okay? Are you going to make sure that everyone on this block is fed before you feed yourself? Do you go around and say, hey, have you had breakfast this morning? Listen. Hey, have you had breakfast this morning? Hey, have you, or are you going to make sure you're eating? And if you have, and if you have an excess, of course you're going to do the human the human condition, and our incentives are going to be to want to help are people. Are you mental? Once excess. The richest fifteen people on the planet have got as much accumulative wealth as the poorest five billion. But you're that's talking, an excess. Uh, no, 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 that's no, no. An excess. Okay, okay. Excuse me. First and foremost, you're talking about literally. Point zero 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 one percent of the world is what Let's you're talking about. Okay, Let's but get and, 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 and what are and what are they preaching? What do they want? Socialism, so that nobody else has the opportunity to become what they've become. They're the ones that are pushing, not pushing forward. socialism. So, yes, That's they not real are. Well, are you kidding? George Soros doesn't want socialist policies. Jeff Bezos, the richest man in the world. The most dominant cultural attributes maintained are the ones that are reinforced by your environment. You know, even Obama's cradle-to-grave fictional ad called The Life of Julia suggests an anti-capitalist socialist framework. The New York Times says this man is America's most famous Marxist economist, and his name is Richard Wolff. Professor, welcome. Information is a serial process, meaning the only way that a human being can come up with any idea is through taking in dependent information that allows that idea to be realized. We appear to be culturally programmed from the moment we are coming into this world to the moment we die. I'm a child of the 1960s. I went to the London School of Economics, which in those days was pure Marxism. And then Marxism came and went out of fashion. The word socialism went out of fashion. But I think it's back. Why is it back? You know, it's an old story. Socialism is, in a way, the shadow of capitalism. Nothing guarantees the future of socialism so much as capitalism, because socialism is capitalism self-criticism. You know, every economic system has had the people who love it and the people who don't. And if you want to know where the masses are worse, worse off, worst off, it's exactly in the kinds of societies that depart from that. So that the record of history is absolutely crystal clear that there is no alternative way so far discovered of improving the lot of the ordinary people that can hold a candle to the productive activities that are unleashed by a free enterprise system. But it seems to reward not virtue as much as ability to manipulate the system. If you are born into a society which rewards competition over collaboration, then you most likely will adopt those values in order to survive. The point is, we are essentially biochemical machines. And while the integrity of our machine processing power and memory is contingent in part on genetics, the source of our actions come fundamentally from the ideas and experiences installed on our mental hardware by the world around us. In turn, the more established they become, the more cultural influence they tend to have on us, including our values and hence our identities and perspectives. Why do we not have the equality that capitalism promised? And the answer is in the analysis of capitalism, the way in which capitalism organizes society with employers and employees. If human beings do not buy things, companies and stores cannot afford to pay their employees. If an employee cannot be paid, then that employee, which is also the consumer, cannot go out and spend the money they receive from employment back into the system to perpetuate the cycle. The kind of parallel to lords and serfs and masters and slaves, such that the employees produce the wealth that the capitalists get into their hands, thereby becoming wealthier while the mass of the working people are excluded from the very surplus their creativity puts on this earth. In other words, there's an explanation. What does reward virtue? You think the uh, communist commissar rewards virtue? You think a Hitler rewards virtue? You think, excuse me, if you'll pardon me, do you think American presidents reward virtue? If people do not constantly spend their money, the entire economic structure, including the entire labor system, would completely collapse. Do they choose their appointees on the basis of the virtue of the people appointed or on the basis of their political clout? The highest priority of any corporation or, in fact, any government that cares about its economy 
is to make sure the public has an immediate interest to constantly consume. Is it really true that political self-interest is nobler somehow than economic self-interest? It is interesting to point out that America was originally founded on a certain degree of a Protestant work ethic, a Protestant worldview, where thrift and savings were actually dominant values back then. Since that time, advertising agencies had to switch their arguments from utility-oriented angles to those engaged in for emotional appeal and status enhancement. Americans now consume twice as much as they did before the end of World War II. You know, I think you're taking a lot of things for granted. And just tell me where in the world you find these angels who are going to organize society for us. Well, I don't even trust you to do that.